Good evening, Emergence. Would you stand to your feet and worship Jesus with us?
God like you who knows us, who loves us, despite our weakness, despite our frailty, God, and we can come before you and worship you because, God, you are the one who brings stability to our lives when things are uncertain, when things seem unstable in the world around us, God. We thank you for, um, God, for who you are. God, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you made a way for us to have a relationship with you through Jesus, through the cross. God, we worship you. God, we pray that, that you would continue to, uh, to open our hearts, to worship you well, God, to press in, to be more like you, Father, and, uh, and God, to be able to live by faith. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it really is a blessing to be able to worship together. Tonight, if you're a guest with us, we're really glad that you're here uh, and would like for you to, to fill out a connect card. You can find that in the, the seat back in front of you or behind you if you're on the front row. Um, we would just love to, to have a record of your being here with us, and you can drop that by the connect desk after service, and, um, and we have a, a small gift that we would love to give to you. Uh, but before we continue to worship together, uh, would you guys take a moment to greet those around you and then you can have a seat. of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 3. All right. Well, hey, uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you guys. And uh, tonight is a, a really huge night as a church because we begin a brand new series today where we're going to jump into over the next six weeks, Hebrews chapter 11. And we are at the midpoint series of our first initiative that we began last year. And so if you were with us last year, as a church last fall, we began a two-year discipleship and generosity journey that, that we're calling first, uh, where we ask the question together as a church, uh, what's it mean for 
the reality in our lives that God gave his first and best to us in Christ, uh, what would it look like with our lives to respond in such a way where we live for him, where we offer our lives first and best? And, and since we launched that initiative last fall, it was an amazing response, and the church stepped forward and was an awesome, awesome step of faith as in, it, it kind of prayerfully exceeded the goals we set forth. And since that point last fall, it, it's been a whirlwind. You know, there's um, continual record attendance numbers, continual um, record people coming to faith in Christ and being baptized. And we're seeing space full in children's ministries. And we're constantly trying to pivot to continue to make space to, to meet the needs of children and moving classes around and knocking down some walls and moving uh, uh, into, into different buildings. And, and God's just done a really cool thing. We're seeing record numbers in our student ministries. The, the launch this fall has been incredible. And just um, the amount of students stepping into discipleship, stepping into hearing the gospel and coming to faith in Christ. And it, it's led us to this place where, as a church, we are... Um, looking at all that God's done in front of us and the reality of where we are with our first initiative. And uh, we, we believe we're at a place where we got to take a, a step of faith in that. And so I'm excited to share a, a video with you guys that we put together. I'd, I'd love to share all of this with you guys, but for the sake of like being succinct and and because there's a ton of information so it's a little longer video than we normally show and before we jump into Hebrews 11 though I do want you to see this where the first initiative is at so uh, we can get our heads around what we're stepping into in, in the next couple months and and um, so I'd love to share it but already I'm taking too long to even explain it and so uh, check out what what's in front of us here From the beginning of our church, we always wanted to be clear that we exist to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe, like Paul says, that the gospel is both the power of God for salvation and for his ministry and our ministry, the message of first importance. In response to that call, last year our church stepped out in a historic step of faith in a two-year discipleship and generosity initiative we called FIRST. We see clearly in Scripture that God gave His first and best for us in His Son, Jesus Christ. So together as a church, we wanted to ask the question, what would it look like for us as Christians to take inventory of our own lives and honestly ask, in my life, is Christ first and best? So what we did for six weeks last fall is we studied the scriptures, a theology of first in both Sunday sermons, small groups, we prayed and we wrestled with the hope that every single Christian at Emergence Church would lean in in a step of faith and generosity and join us in this journey called first. What happened next was amazing. After six weeks of preaching and praying and studying and community, where each person took the time personally to ask, what in my life would it look like with Christ if he was first and best? We responded in a step of faith and generosity in the most powerful generosity response in the history of our church. And the congregation responded so powerfully in faith that not only did we meet the goal, but we exceeded it. This past year, as we committed to that goal together, we've continued to see God work through the ministry of this church. We once again saw record numbers of baptisms. In fact, in June, over 112 people were baptized. Of those 112 people baptized, 34 were from our Thursday night service. It's amazing to think that that service did not even exist until last October. And on that day, we got to celebrate 34 new people in the kingdom of heaven attending a service that was in October only a year old. A major focus of FIRST was expansion to build adequate children's space that could support a future 1200 seat auditorium. Again, this past year, God worked mightily in our youth and children's ministry. In fact, in 2024, we saw 51% growth in our student ministry, which is incredible. And not just in our student ministry. In fact, we saw a 52% growth in our children's ministry that was already at capacity. 
We as a church are currently making another pivot in order to make space by moving the third grade out of E-Town and over into Suite 300 to join 45th Street, which is currently our fourth and fifth grade ministry, in order to simply alleviate the current massive growth. Now, a year into this first journey, two realities are before us. The first is our church continues in a season of unprecedented growth. As I mentioned earlier, one of the steps we took to try to make space was to create a Thursday night service. That service today is healthy and reaching people weekly for Christ. However, it has not solved our attendance issue. Just listen to this reality. Last year, our church at capacity somehow still experienced 20% growth in 2024. Over the last two years, the church has seen 58% growth of its Sunday and now Thursday night attendance. Listen, I, I know that's a lot of numbers, but you have to realize we're not talking about numbers. We're talking about family members, friends, neighbors, people who we love who are coming to know Christ as you guys invite and share your faith. And there's still people all over North Jersey that we love and we wanna do all we can to make the space for them. And so a year into this first journey, we're confronted with a real situation. We have to make space. One of the things we've said from the beginning of this church is we'll always refuse to put out the no vacancy sign and we'll do all that we can to share the good news with all we can because if the people of North Jersey are going to reject God, they're going to have to crawl over us to do that. And because of that heartbeat and the faithfulness of you all in this church, who pray and who share their faith, we now have a very real space crisis. So the first reality we need to be honest about with where we are is we have an alarming space need. The second reality is we wanna to continue to ask the question that's been guiding this whole discipleship journey. What would it look like in my life for Jesus to be first and best? We're a year in and now's the time to ask how this year has changed us and are we still asking that question? Because the truth is what first and best looks like is not a one-time question. It's a lifelong discipleship goal. And this is where those two issues have come together. First, in light of all that God's done at our church with growth and new folks in the past year, as well as, secondly, the season of discipleship and generosity where we're asking the question to the Lord, what does first and best look like in my life? Those two realities have now come together where we're at the place going, we need to take a step of bold faith. And what does bold faith look like? We know as a church we'll always be about the gospel. That will always be first importance. But now we believe it's time for us as a church to take a bold step of faith. Here's the truth. I think it'd be really tempting one year into this initiative where, where, let's just be honest, it's going really well. We are hitting our marks. In fact, we're even above most of the marks for where we should currently be right now. And, and that's a time where a temptation can sneak in. And as a church, we could be tempted to hit cruise control and just coast the rest of the way. But the truth is our heart right now is the opposite. What we see God doing right now is the opposite. And with all the new people who've joined us over the last year, with all the growth and confirmation along the way, we believe now's the time not to coast, but to boldly accelerate toward our vision. And that bold acceleration take an increased step of faith as well. So honestly, that's where we are today. Over the past year, we've prayed and we've wrestled with all that God's doing, the lack of space and the reality of the timeline to do phase one. And originally the plan was a future phase two. And so it looked like we had a situation where we we're gonna build our children's ministry in phase one, the support ministries for the future auditorium that we would build down the road as part of phase two. 
However, with the pain of growth and just honestly, the length of that project, potentially those two phases being six to seven years, the, the leadership of this church felt like the more we looked at the numbers and the reality of what God's doing, the more we asked and prayed and sought wisdom, the more we became convinced that we needed to take a step of bold faith. And as a result, I'm excited to share with you guys, we're expanding our first initiative in order to accelerate the timeline, to create space, to reach as many people as quickly as possible. Let me real practically talk about how that was gonna look. So first, as we've said from the entire initiative, we're committing to what we call first importance. That's what we always do. Uh, that's our annual budget. That's the main things. That's the preaching of the gospel, the sending of missionaries, uh, the week to week functioning, the meeting needs, the, the operations of the church. That's uh, what makes Emergence Church function. And that number doesn't change one bit. Our annual budget that we projected two years ago, we're keeping that exactly the same, even in spite of all the growth and in spite of all God's doing. We wanna be really frugal and control as many of our expenses as we can to push as much into expansion as possible. Now here's where things are going to get a little different. Uh, it's not that we're not doing what we committed to. We're still very much going to build a children's space. We're still very much going to build student space. Uh, what we're doing is not changing the initiative, we're expanding the initiative. And this is what we're calling first bold step. Instead of waiting for a future campaign, we're going to prioritize the building of the auditorium. We're going to raise the initial funds for us to start to build the 11 to 1200 seat auditorium to both meet our current needs and expand for the future folks that God seems to keep bringing. We're also still committed and need to expand our children and youth space in this phase. And this is the third piece, what we're calling first families. We're expanding in this initiative where we're gonna build our kids ministry that can adequately minister to a 1200 seat auditorium as well as a first phase student ministry space, which will more than adequately for the next several years of student ministry, serve our growing population of students that are coming out and being ministered to there. We believe that this expanded plan allows us to make as much space to minister to the most amount of people as quickly as possible. Like we've said before from the beginning of this church, we've always unapologetically tried to reach as many people with the gospel of Christ as we can. And we believe this is a time for a bold step that will allow us just to do that. Now, in order to do this, we are in need of both increased faith and increased resources and response. Our goal in FIRST when we started a year ago was to raise $13.7 million. We saw the congregation respond with a $14 million commitment last fall, which was incredible. However, the new number we hope to raise over this year, we want to move up in light of the reality of the amount of new givers to our church, new attenders of our church, as well as new folks leaning in with some increased faith and move the first initiative goal from $13.7 million to $15 million. Uh, we believe this increase balances both wisdom and faith and is entirely possible. Let me quickly break down the estimated numbers for you. As we've already said, the first thing of first was first importance. That doesn't change. The budget for last year and this year is still the originally committed $9.2 million, which is two years of operating expenses. That includes everything from missionaries to church plants to staff to electricity to all the things that make the church move forward. What we're hoping to add to the first initiative is what we're now calling our first bold step. And we're hoping to raise $3.8 million to begin the construction of the auditorium and lobby space, as well as committing $2 million to our family expansion to build the children's ministry and phase one of 
the youth space. Those numbers make up $15 million. Now, honestly, that money will not cover the total costs of all we hope to do, but we believe it's a bold step of faith while also being responsible with what we can raise. The truth is we'll secure financing in order to complete the auditorium and children's phase in phase one of the youth ministry uh, space initiative. Listen, I know it's a bold step, but I do believe as we've sought counsel and prayed and just looked at the reality of all God's doing, we believe it's a wise and attainable step. For some reason, God's placed his hand on our church. Uh, God's allowing us to see amazing growth. I believe we have a responsibility to do what we can in order to continue to make the space for those that he's bringing. I want to say something else. Honestly, for me, this is one of the most encouraging seasons for us as a church we've ever been in. To see folks taking first-time steps of discipleship and hearing stories and getting emails about how God's used this initiative, not just in their own discipleship, but how it's strengthened their marriage or how faith has increased in their homes and families and children. And it's just been overwhelming to see the response of this congregation. And so I want to share with you, honestly, I'm really excited about this next step together. And I'm praying that we get to see God do more than we could ask or imagine as we move into this new phase of expansion. So if I said all that, it would have been at least double the time. So, you know, rejoice in that. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, amazing to celebrate what God's doing. What, what's happening right now is there's some, some resources coming down uh, uh, that we want to get into your hands to guide us over the next six weeks of this Midpoint Discipleship Series together as we study through Hebrews chapter 11. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd ask you to do is as you get this, just just throw your name on it. So there's like a there's like a pen in front of you, and if you just want to take this white piece of uh, page there and put your name on it, uh, you know, take take one each. Don't be like, hey, uh, I'll just take one. We'll save the the money for our our family. We'll just take one. You don't need to give us two. We've already bought them, and so it doesn't save us any money when we throw them in the trash. And so uh, t- take that, and and really, what you'll find in this book is a number of highlights you saw in the video. Here's what's wild about even this book, okay? Just to give you a small st- of like sample of how crazy this is right now. Uh, we made this book, we began to kind of work on it, put it together uh, about two months ago. And since we've put this book together, uh, we've seen over 100 people baptized that aren't even in the resources of this book or, or the video. Um, we've seen, again, record number in, in students and children just, just smash through um, the old number. And so it's, it's just a, a wild season that we can't even print materials fast enough to celebrate what God's done in the highlights. So there's, there's highlights since even these highlights, which, which is just awesome. So uh, first thing, just throw your name in here. So if, if you lose it, we can get it back to you. And, and I, trust, I trust you won't lose it. Um, second thing, if you flip over to page 17, page 17, you'll find there's a, a note section for week one. And so the hope is throughout this series that each week, over the next six weeks, you'd have this book, you'd bring it with you, and you'd track with the sermon series, and you'd take the time to make notes on Hebrews chapter 11, whatever kind of God impacts you with as we study through the series together. You'll notice on the next page, page 19 and 20, uh, for week one, those are the community group questions. As you guys know, in our church, we're sermon-based community groups for the most part, and in our sermon-based communities, we'll be working through Hebrews 11, and you can bring this book with you to your community group. And all, all the questions are there. You know, I don't, I don't know. Some of you guys are, are, you like to prep and get ahead, but you don't have to do that. Um, and, and, and that'll, that'll be helpful for you. And so, uh, take the time to, to read through some of the really cool stories that God's done in, in this book over the last year since we started this initiative. And, and then in the back, if you were with us last year, uh, you know that, that this is our, our commitment cards for, for how we respond in this. And the hope is that this would become 
a real discipleship tool uh, for you personally, for a, you and your home, for your marriage, for your family, uh, about what it looks like to honor God with first and best. And, and the big ask is uh, that over the next six weeks, you, you'd lean in, right? And, and you just pray about it. And I realize for some of you guys, you're visiting tonight, you're glad you're here, you're getting the family, we're glad you're here, you're getting a bit of the family talk, okay? Okay. Um, but, but maybe, who knows, God might be prompting you and, and you might be part of the reason we're able to finish the second leg of the journey so successfully. And so um, the hope is that you take this and this would be uh, for you a, a discipleship prompt, that you'd put it somewhere visible where you could see it. Um, maybe for you that's in your Bible and you're just going to take this and you know you're going to read the Bible every morning and there in your Bible you're going to see it, you're going to remember to pray, God, what's it look like for me to honor you with first and best and the reality that Christ gave his first and best? Or uh, I I had a a friend last year who told me in his family what they did with this card is they, they put it on their dinner table and uh, at night before they prayed for their meal or as they prayed for their meal, they'd also take the time together as a family to pray for the church, uh, to pray that they would, as a family, honor God first and best. What a cool opportunity to teach your children about discipleship. One of the things is, that is um, a little sad, like technology is awesome in that we can give online and we can automate things like that. One of the sad things sometimes is our children never get to see us do it. I remember growing up and watching my dad write a check to the church every week, and, and the, the, it was a powerful teaching moment. And, and our children don't always get to see that, but when you do something like place this on your table and remind your children that God's given us everything, we're stewards, and we want to honor him as stewards, it's just a cool opportunity to lead your family, to pray for them. Uh, I know last year for, for Rochelle and I, I kept it up in our room on our nightstand, and before bed we would pray together for the initiative for first and best. I know some people put it on like a bulletin board in your home. Wherever you know, you're going to have it in front of you uh, to pray for us as a church, to pray for response. Um, I, I trust you with that, and, and I look forward to it. And then we're going to take these weeks to pray about what first and best looks like in our lives. And then on November 14th and 17th, we're going to have Commitment Sunday, where we come forward and we celebrate our step of faith in the second year of the first initiative. Now, um, there's so much more I want to share with you guys, but we just don't have time today. Um, there's drawings, there's renderings of what the new space is going to look like, how it's going to lay out. We're going to share those with you guys next week. And so um, do all you can to make sure you don't miss next week as you're going to get to see what the facility will look like, um, some architectural renderings, some uh, pictures of, of how the room's laid out. It's not exact, but it's a sample of just how it all works. And I, I wish we had time tonight, but eventually we got to jump into Hebrews chapter 11. And so uh, I'm most excited for that. And so here we go. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll jump into Hebrews 11 together. So let's pray. God, thank you that you are at work. Thank you that you have your people um, thank you that you are bringing people as we lift up Jesus. Jesus says, as my name's lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And our prayer, God, is there's so many people in North Jersey that don't know you. We want to lift you up and see people come to know you. And eternities changed and lives changed and marriages changed and whole family legacies that are broken changed for your glory. And Lord, we know that you and you alone are able to do it. And so help us, Lord, to respond in faith as your people. Thank you for this chapter of scripture we get to look at in Hebrews 11, where we see people who walked by faith. That faith isn't always like just sitting still and stagnant. Faith is a verb and action. And I pray that our faith, like the people in this chapter of scripture, would be visible. It'd be visible in our community. It'd be visible to our families. It'd be visible to those we love, that we love Jesus and it's changed how we live. And that faith would lead us to places where we're light and we're faithful and we're courageous, all for your glory, Lord. And now would you open our ears and our hearts as we look at your word and be encouraged by what faith is. We ask all that, God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
For by it, people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Hebrews is a fascinating letter. It's written to uh, a group of Christians who are starting to go through a hard season, right? Um, the, the persecution has begun. It doesn't appear that they're losing their lives for their faith at this point, but they're losing their homes, they're suffering, and there are those who've begun walking with God and they're starting to wonder, is this all really worth it? And some are even beginning to, it looks like, be tempted to walk away from their faith back into Judaism. And so much of Hebrews is, is, a, is a, like a letter to encourage Christians, continue on, right? Persevere, uh, persevere in faith. And we get to this great chapter in Hebrews 11 where the writer's just gonna walk us through the, like the history of the Old Testament and just show us, here's how you're gonna persevere. How, here's how you're gonna honor Christ with your life. You're, you're gonna walk faithfully where God's placed you. And he starts with this really cool definition. He says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's an incredible definition for faith. Assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. Now, We have to be honest about that. If you don't fully understand the context of what he's trying to say in this verse, you can take that definition and make an absolute mess, right? Like if you're just like, okay, so all we need is faith and then I can have the assurance of things I don't see and and hope things that that others don't have and and I can have it, right? So a lot of times when Matt, my kids sports events. I've shared this with you guys before. People ask me, what do I do? I tell them I'm a pastor and they're always like, oh, and they never know what to do, you know, and they try to get away as quickly as possible. And then sometimes they'll say things like, well, that's just, it's great that you have faith. And they'll say, I mean, isn't that the main thing that we just have faith? And for them, the concept is it's like faith in faith. It doesn't really matter what your faith is in as long as you have some faith. Where the writer of Hebrews is going, no, it, absolute faith is only as good as the object of who you've put your faith in, right? Faith is only as good as its object. And in that way, faith, think of it, is like a windshield. It helps us look through to see the object, And if you just have faith in faith, if you think, well, all that matters is if we have faith, it's like driving your car looking just at the windshield. If you're just looking at the windshield, you're inevitably gonna make a mess. Because the goal of the windshield is not to look at the windshield, it's to look through it. The goal of faith is not to just look at faith, it's to look through it at the object of your faith. And if you don't understand that, if you think, well, it's just the assurance of what I hope for, the conviction of what I haven't seen. You could hear that and you could take this and you could make an absolute wreck of your life. And you go, you know what? I've, I've always wanted to fly. And now I read in Hebrews that faith is the assurance of what I hope for. And I hope that I can fly. And I've got my vision board. And on my vision board, I wrote fly. And I've got my mantras. You can fly. You're a bird. You can fly. You're a bird. I've been saying my mantras. I've been manifesting flight, right? I've been doing all the things. I've been believing I can fly. And you can go up on the roof of this building 100% convinced, like 100% without a doubt faith, I'm going to fly and face the assurance of what I hope for. And if you jump off the roof, what's gonna happen? You're gonna hit the ground hard, right? You're not even gonna glide. You're just gonna, and you're not gonna fly. And you, you hear that and go, well, what God's word says, it's the assurance of what I hope for. Well, God's word didn't fail, you failed to understand God's word. It's assurance of what you hope for when you have the right object of faith. That is, the right object of our faith is to know God, 
to know his word. In fact, notice where Hebrews start. He says, hey, um, by this faith, we understand the world was created. That all we're experiencing is not just an accident. It just didn't happen because nothing suddenly became something and blew up and all landed like this. That at some point, there's a sense of, hey, there's a creator. There's, there's an order to this creation. I can know this creator. If there's no creator, then nothing matters. There's no purpose to life. There's no purpose to death. We're somehow an accident floating on a rock through space. There's no moral lawgiver. There's no justice. Your life doesn't matter one drop whatsoever. You're going to die in a pointless universe and the universe is going to burn up and nothing matters at all. (laughs) That's where Hebrew starts. That's a really depressing view. The truth is there is a creator. And that creator is worth knowing. And when he becomes the object of our faith, then we grow in truth, then we grow in purpose, then we grow in meaning, then we grow in life. Then we're able to bless people, then we're we're able to do justice. Then we're able to be a blessing. Then death really matters, then eternity matters because we can know the object of our faith. That there's a creator and he loves us and he wants us to know him. And this is really why the more you know of the creator, the more you know of the word of God, the more courageously you can walk in faith. Now, I I think that's interesting because I think most people don't understand faith that way. Like most people, if you just say, hey, you need to have faith, and you say that to someone on the street in New Jersey, what do they think that means? What you need to have faith means I just shut off my brain and I just take bold steps. Well, that's biblically not faith at all. I would argue that's not how faith works at all. So so I always say it like this. When my uh, oldest daughter was six years old, she was pretty quick to learn to swim. And there was a a lake that my parents grew grew up in a lake community called Faison Lakes. And if you know that area, you know there's a... uh, dock out in the lake and there's a big diving board called the high dive and so my daughter was six and she's like I want to jump off that and I'm like cool because that's me as a dad let's do it you know <laughs> some of you guys are like let's put a floaty on and wrap up not not in my house we're gonna jump and so we swim out to the dock and we get there and I say hey just so you know uh, when you get up to the top it's gonna look higher than it does right now so you're gonna get up to the edge it's gonna look much higher it's okay I just want you to know it's okay. There's a lifeguard, look, right over there on the beach. And there's a lifeguard here on the dock. And I'm right here. And I've watched people jump off this board my whole life. And no one's ever died on ours. And um, I'm just kidding. No one's ever died. And so you can know, you can, you can do this. Lifeguard, lifeguard, I'm here, all right? And um, she walks out, a little like six-year-old, and gets to the edge of the board. And she freezes. I'm like, oh, no. And so I, you know, walk up to the diving board, and I go out to the board, and I'm like, hey. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. I didn't do it. I thought about it. I didn't. Um, um, I didn't even climb up. I said, listen, um, there's a lifeguard there. There's a lifeguard there. I'm right here. And then what happened? She jumped. So Why? Why did she lose faith? She stopped thinking. She stopped reasoning. And so many people, what they think faith is, is they think faith is shutting off the mind, but actually, biblically, faith is looking at the object of our faith. In fact, if you read through Hebrews 11, notice how many times it says something like, by faith, this person reasoned that God was who he was or considered who God was. And the object, they had to stop and they had to think. And the object of their faith helped them consider that I can take a step of faith. He's faithful. And it's fascinating because the very people who think faith is just the shutting off of your mind, when you tell them that and you say, what about you? You know what they're going to say? I don't want to think about this anymore. How many times have you had a conversation with someone about faith and they start asking questions and you start answering questions and they're like, oh my goodness, I don't want to think about this right now. See, faith is not the shutting off of the mind. In fact, sometimes rejecting faith is choosing to put our head in the sand and not think about our creator, not think about the purpose of our life. 
not walk in any boldness. And, and that's why the more you know the object of your faith, the more courageous and correctly you can walk in faith. Because if you only know like half things in the Bible, you're going to really make a mess. Right? Like verses like, uh, if we delight in the Lord, he gives us the desires of our heart. You might be like, oh, if we delight in the Lord, he gives us the desires of my heart. I want a Lamborghini. That's the desire of my heart. I want a Lamborghini. I believe Lamborghini. Name it and claim it. Well, what's the problem? You only got half the verse. What have you not done? Delighted in the Lord. And when you delight in the Lord, when you delight in the things that he loves, he changes your heart. Where you start to go, well, what does God love? How can my life be a delight for you? What's it mean for me to be content and enjoy what you've given me? And suddenly, the more you delight in the Lord, the more the desires of your heart change. See, that's faith, the object of our faith. And then our assurance is in him. And then our trust is in him and his promises. And when you live a life where you trust who he is and where you trust in his promises, then you can live a life of courage and truth and boldness and faith that pleases him. In fact, notice what the verse says. This is what all the people of faith were commended for. That when God looks down and he sees a person living, he goes, yes, that's it. They're doing it. That's my children. That's my son. That's my daughter. You know what he's fired up to see? Your confidence is in him. Your confidence is in his promise, in his promise. And the more you know it, the more boldly you walk. And in that way, he says, that's what every great life looks like. And that type of faith, there's reward. Because faith has a reward. And he's going to give two examples, okay? Two examples of that type of faith. Here, here's the first. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. First example of faith, he says, is, is, is Abel. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? God says, hey, you're going to go bring an offering to me. It's the first offering in the Bible. The first kind of generosity response to God. And Abel brings livestock and Cain brings produce from the field. And some people wonder, is the issue, the reason God accepted Abel's offering but not Cain? Is it because it was an animal? Because it had blood or something like that? Is that why he liked it? But the text actually tells us why God approved of Abel's offering and not Cain. Look what it says. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of his firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. You see the difference? What's Abel's gift? Firstborn. Does it take faith to give the firstborn of your flock? Yes, firstborn and fat portions. Best portions. Abel said in the first offering in the Bible, God, I give you first and best. I trust you. My trust is not in what you've provided. My trust is not in my resources. My trust is not my income. My ultimate trust is you. And I'm going to declare with this offering, my ultimate confidence and trust is you. And I'm going to offer first and best. And with that offering, God said righteous, satisfied. The reward of his offering. Here's the second by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Right? We go from Genesis chapter 3 where the fall is. Chapter 4 is Cain and Abel. Chapter 5 is this genealogy. You know, like when you start your annual Bible reading plan, I feel like... In January, this is where reading plans go to die, right? I'm reading through the whole Bible, and then it's a list of names in Genesis chapter 5. 
But actually from Genesis 3, where sin enters the world, all the way to Genesis chapter 11, it's a little depressing. Because what the author is bringing out in Genesis 3 to 11 is mankind sins and nothing mankind can do is stopping it. Right? Even being in the right family doesn't stop it. Having educational advances doesn't stop it. Technological advances doesn't stop it. Um, societal advances don't, doesn't stop sin. In fact, it, it's getting worse and worse. Even God's wrath doesn't stop sin. Right? The, the flood is poured out. And even, even the second Noah gets off the boat, he's like, yeah, we did it, let's get drunk. Right? Like, no matter what you see, from Genesis 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, it's the spread of sin until finally in Genesis 12, God himself steps in and says, I'll make a promise, I'll bring about a man named Abraham. So we get to Genesis 5, and it's this genealogy, and it's wild, right? Because two things come out of that genealogy. One, they all live incredibly long lives. Right? This person lives 600 years. This person lives 700 years. They're like, what is that? It's incredibly long lives. But what's the point? Even really long lives doesn't stop sin. Or as we like to joke here at Emergence, your grandma's a wicked sinner. Right? Even long lives don't stop sin. And they all die. Until we get to this man, Enoch. And it says, Enoch walked with God in the middle of this genealogy where it's like, he died, he died, he died, he died. I guess Enoch, and it says, Enoch walked with God and then he was no more. There was something about the reality of how Enoch walked with the Lord that death was not the final word. His life didn't end with and he died, it was different. There's a reward. It always makes me guess, am I walking well with God? Enoch walked with God in faith. And his reward was death was not the final word. And then here's the exclamation point on this. It says, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For who would ever draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Here's the beautiful thing of faith. You can't please God without it. You'll, like you can do all the good works in the world. You can have all the discipline in the world. You can do so many nice things. But if you have no faith, God's not pleased with it. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he rewards those who earnestly sneak him. That God delights to reward your faith. And this is where sometimes Christians can be more spiritual than the Bible. Because some Christians are like, I don't know. I don't need a reward I'll just be happy enough to please God. I'm not worried about spiritual treasure, or eternal crown or any of that stuff. But you know what the Bible says? You should be motivated by reward. Jesus says, you should be motivated by reward. You should want to glorify God. You should want to earn spiritual treasure. You don't need to be more spiritual than the Bible. You should want a big crown that you could throw down at Jesus' feet. There's nothing wrong with being motivated by the rewards that God loves, that he loves to give. But he says what? I give those rewards to those who seek me. Well, that word seek there is like diligently seek. So one of the big issues of endurance that my wife has to deal with uh, being married to me um, as I sanctify her for the glory of God um, and my kids do it too is I don't know if this is your marriage but I can't find anything in the fridge <laughs> nothing you know and so I'll be like do we have mayonnaise because I, like, <laughs> I ask before I even open it. Because I know once I get in there, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I can't see. And uh, so she'll be like, yeah, it's in the fridge. Just look. So I do. I open the fridge. Milk, eggs, butter. That's it. <laughs> and I'm like, there's no mayo in here. She goes, just look. 
I'm looking. There's none. And what she do? If, if this is your marriage, she comes over, she takes the milk carton. There's stuff behind it. <laughs> she moves it, and right there's the mayo. I'm like, well, if you knew where it was, why don't you just tell now? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, what is, what's, the, what's the difference? When I open the fridge, I'm not seeking. I'm not looking. I'm not tearing the thing apart. The faith that God rewards is the faith where we seek him. Where we seek his word, where we seek his promises. One of my big prayers for us over the next couple weeks is that we would say, God, I want a faith that seeks you. I want a faith that walks with you. I want a faith where as I live, I'm offering my first and best for you, trusting you reward that faith. And I, I don't know what that looks like for you, but could you imagine a year from now looking back and going in 2024 and 2025, that was a year where I diligently sought the Lord. Maybe for some of you guys, you just gotta let some stuff go. You gotta repent of some stuff that's just in the way. Pull out the milk container of sin, right? But imagine, you said for this year, I want to earnestly seek him because I trust he rewards those who do. And for others of you guys, tonight you walked in and you're not a Christian. And we're glad you're here. But what if tonight was the night for the first time you realized that God wants you to know him. God wants you to walk with him. And you can because Jesus came. And Jesus made a better offer, offering than Abel. He went to a cross and he poured out his blood. God gave his first and best. And Jesus walked better with God than Enoch. And he didn't avoid death, but he went through death and conquered death so that we could have peace with God and forgiveness of sins. And how cool would it be if tonight for some of you guys was the night where you said, you know what? It's time for me to really push in to the true object of faith. The one object of faith that will never fail and never let me down, that created the universe and created me and my whole life from him as a gift. And it's time I started honoring him with it. And what if tonight was the night you repented of your sins and you said, I want to seek you and I want to know the reward of forgiveness of sins, of peace with God and eternal life. And if that's you, let tonight be the night you surrender to him. Let tonight be the night you say, God, I'm tired of putting my faith in myself or my reasoning or my friendships or my money. I want to put my faith in you because you alone are the eternal object of faith that never fails. And so I surrender. Be my God. Forgive my sins. Give me a new heart and then help me live boldly and courageously for faith. So I'm going to pray for us as we respond tonight in worship that we would be people of faith. Let's, let's pray together. God, we, um, we're thankful for, um, that you challenge us. We're thankful that you call us to take steps of faith in our lives, to not just go through the motions and, and do the same things, but you want us to seek you and draw near to you and walk with you. And so, God, I pray that we would. I pray... Um, for those who love you, that you'd give them a real sense that let this year be the year I seek you. And for some of them, it's really clear what that step is, that next step for them is. There's something in the way. Um, there's something they know needs to be removed from their lives. And let tonight be a night of repentance and faith for them. And Lord, for, for those who for the first time are saying, I'm living with all the wrong objects of faith. No wonder, no wonder it's so, it's so frustrating. Would tonight be the night they surrender to you, the one who came and poured himself out on a cross so that we could have forgiveness of sins and peace with God, the reward of eternal life. 
And for them, would today be a day of surrender where they declare you Lord by faith. Thank you that Ephesians says it's by grace, it's grace we've been saved through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. Would we know the salvation that's found in putting our faith in you? We ask all that, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, please stand as we enter into a time of worship with this new song.
it's um, the prayer for us that, that um, this season would begin a step of discipleship for us where we go, I'm stepping in faith. I'm not foolish faith, not blind faith, not wrong faith, but focused on face object. I know God, I know his word, I know his promises, and it's time to walk in faith in some of those. And so can I pray for us that we would? God, thank you that you're good and you're faithful. Thank you that your spirit, God, will convict and lead people um, to what that step looks like. God, thank you for all the folks who are coming to know you as a result of the friends in this room that are sharing the good news. Would you give them a sense of boldness and joy as they go out now this week and share um, the hope of the world found in you? And Lord, I pray, I pray for those even tonight who felt um, pierced by your truth. Would they not go to bed tonight till they know they're right with you, until they find salvation? And uh, would they rejoice that it's by faith? We ask all that, God, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you'd like prayer for anything, there's a prayer team over there by the cross. Don't forget your books. You're going to need them for a community group. And uh, hope you have a great week and see you next week.